All right, welcome back in here to the Jordy Colada Show, brought to you by Lance Beal, attorney at law here on this Sunday night. Good friend of ours in the uh, the business out on the West Coast who does a tremendous job. Obviously, we mentioned his books, Meat Market, Flip the Script. He's also got a couple of books uh, where he dives in, the, a great one on the quarterback, uh, The Making of a Modern Quarterback is a great read, uh, but you really need to get over to The Athletic right now and check out his latest, his last update, his last uh, article that he has pu- published three hours ago is looking at some of the replacement options for Ed Ogeron. Uh, we welcome in Bruce Feldman into the conversation here on the Jordy Collada Show presented by Go Chevrolet and Lance Beal, attorney at law. Uh, Bruce, good afternoon, good evening. I know you're out on the West Coast. Thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Jordy. Um, I think, Bruce, that this information and this story didn't get real for a lot of people until you tweeted some information about Ogeron's job status a couple of weeks ago. What do you know about the LSU job and kind of how we got here to ultimately on this Sunday morning after LSU plays their best game of 2021, Ogeron gets his pink slip? You know, obviously, I think, Jordy, it became – more real when they couldn't hold off Auburn. You know, you look at that game, Bo Nix Bo Nick, Bo made some great scrambles and they come back to win. It's in Tiger Stadium. And then, um, you know, I, I think as what really stung them was to get run over at Kentucky the way yeah. they did. Yeah. I mean, to me at that point, I think you could feel like, okay, the decision was made. And as I, I mean, I'm writing about this, of the, you know, uh, this kind of hot seat temperature check story I did on a bunch of guys who had hot seat situations around the country. And I think his, it went from very warm to scorching was, you know, kind of how I wrote about it after Kentucky. And then just talking to people really close to the situation late last week, I'm talking like the day before the Florida game, uh, the vibe I got was, it doesn't matter. Even if he wins the next two games before Alabama, even if he somehow beats Florida, and I knew how depleted they were going to be roster-wise, and then even if he goes to Ole Miss and beats Ole Miss, does he have a chance? Mm, I was told no, that they had already made the decision that Scott Woodward wanted his own guy in there, and that was the direction they were going to go in. Obviously, as you saw, as we all saw, they played really hard, and they played well, and they, they took it to Florida and beat the Gators again. But at that point, now, the people I trust in the situation were like, even last night, they're like, no, it's done. It's it's over. And that's, you know, and that's how we got here. And it's just kind of, it's a it's an amazing kind of turn just because it's 21 months from a national title. But, you know, as Ogeron said in his own press conference, you know, a little bit ago, he knows the expectations are incredibly high at LSU. And here we are. So... Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see who they who they end up hiring going forward to to be the next coach here. Before we get to the candidates, and I'm going to talk to you about your list that you have up over at the Athletic right now, and it's a fantastic read. Make sure that you're subscribed over at the Athletic. You're following Bruce Feldman on Twitter for the updates and reading his latest post over there, which dives into some of the replacement options that LSU could be looking at. Bruce, he's eight and eight since he pulled out of the national championship gamer nine and eight after yesterday's win over Florida. Uh, and he has been evaluated on on the the, the football team's play. There, there's also been some other stuff that that has gone into to maybe this quick hook. What what do you think got us here from from Ogeron's standpoint? Being that this is the fastest time we've ever had a discussion of a national championship coach uh, losing his job. I really think it was as I don't want to say as simple as this because I think there's a lot of things that happen that come together. Um, either making a team great or making it not good. And I think what, he, to me, the biggest issues were the, the staff he put together after the national title didn't work out at all. The coordinator hires, everybody kind of knows the Bo Pelini hire it proved to be a disastrous one. And then I think on forward, um, the two coordinators he hired, he went, went much younger. And I think those guys – are still, you know, I think they're both sharp guys, but they're really green and they're learning on the fly. I mean, I was the sideline reporter out at the Rose Bowl when they played UCLA, and you could kind of see that coming, whereas Chip Kelly out-schemed the heck out of the LSU LSU guys. It's not to say that this is the only time this happened. I mean, Ohio State got embarrassed at home by Oregon, where Joe Moore had the offensive coordinator there, out-schemed, you know, Ryan Day's defensive coordinator. Like, it, it happens. 
Um, but I think from that, they were digging out a hole from there, right? Yeah. And then, you know, we saw, you know, they didn't look great against McNeese State. I think they, you know, there were some moments in some other games where they, they were shaky, but I think it was, you know, they couldn't run the ball well until maybe at one point of the Kentucky game, and then obviously they could really run it well, you know, against Florida. But I just think it came back to, so, you know, there were some really good hires he made and there were some really shaky hires he made. And I think that honestly had more to do with it than anything else because, you know, it's like, as we talked about, the standard is incredibly high here. I mean, he won a national title. The guy he beat yesterday, a lot of, you know, a lot of people, including myself, think is a top 25 coach. Dan Mullen has lost to Ed Ogeron three times in a row yeah. and twice with half a team. And he's got, you know, and I'm not saying advocating he should get fired, but it's like, he didn't win a national title. He, he's two and six in his last eight games against power five. It's just, I think the, what we're looking at is it is an incredibly high bar. It is hard to win national titles right now. I mean, technically Ogeron still the head coach at LSU, but there's only four other guys who are active in, in college football who are, have won national titles. So I just think, you know, like LSU is a great job and a top five job with great resources and, and, and great talent. I think, but it's just like a little bit, you know, and that's clearly shown. I mean, this was, I think some of it is also Scott Woodward is the new, is a relative new AD. He did not ha- hire Ed Ogeron. Yeah. I think he wants his own guy. And, you know, now, you know, in a couple months from now, he's going to have his own guy in charge. Do you think for, for that matter, and that not being the only thing, but that being the, the majority of the decision, do you think O had a chance this season? Do you think that he almost was kind of a dead man walking going into the year? No, I definitely think he had a chance. I yeah. mean, you know, look, if if a couple of things, you know, it's, it's weird how some of these things work, but I think if, you know, they they don't, if they don't lose to Auburn, which is a game they were winning, and then, like I said, Bo Nix made some terrific plays, then I don't think the seat is as hot. Does that mean that they don't get blown out at Kentucky? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just like all of a sudden I think one thing leads to another, right? Yeah. Just like... Um, you know, we saw a few things that kind of went their way at different times over the run that leads to a national title. I just think a lot of this is is kind of kind of fickle uh, as much as anything else where, you know, it's it's a like I, I look at how some of these things just kind of like I said, one thing leads to another and it works out or one thing leads to another and it doesn't, you know. And so, I mean, you have a guy who grew up dreaming about LSU got, you know, got to be the head coach. It was very, you know, just the circumstances of how he ended up becoming the head coach at LSU. Like I've told this story a little bit before, but it's like, you know how crazy it is that like LSU was all prepared to, to fire their last miles. They don't, they don't end up firing him. He gets to coach like to start another season. Then he gets fired where he gets fired so early in the process that Ogeron gets a full, almost like a, full season to basically prove himself and that worked out so you have he's the only guy i've ever heard of who's been an interim head coach for almost two full seasons once at usc where he kind of was able to show people he wasn't the coach anymore that the the way people saw him at ole miss and then again at lsu he showed he had kind of evolved so it's just it's just interesting how this stuff kind of works when you take a couple of steps back from that Bruce Feldman joining us here on the Jordy Collada Show, presented by Lance Beal, attorney at law down in the Acadiana area. You can follow Bruce on Twitter, at Bruce Feldman CFB. He is a writer over at The Athletic, where there is a great uh, published uh, write-up from Feldman from three hours ago, talking about who's next. You've seen Scott Woodward at work. You are familiar with how he approaches these types of openings. He is now back at his home school at LSU, playing with the head coaching job. I said that when he was on the job with Saban back through 2000 and 2004, he, he, he aspired to come back in an administrative role. He knew at some point he was going to have to make this hire, and he understands how monumental this is for LSU football right now. Where, where do you think he starts, and what do you expect from Woodward in this opening and where he goes? I mean, from talking to people close to him, um, I think there's been a conversation probably already with Jimbo Fisher. I don't know how far it's getting. I don't know if it's going to get very far at all um, in terms of that. But I think that would would be an obvious one. The one I had heard about um, this afternoon was that, hey, he's going to take a big swing and make Dabo Sweeney say no. 
Um, now the question I would ask, and I pose this this person was, um, would he actually want to be in, in Nick Saban's own division when the ACC is set up for him and Clemson to dominate? I mean, and he's paid a fortune. He's got really good facilities. I, you know, his, his kids play there. I don't, I don't know. That would be, that would be a big poll for Scott Woodward. The other names that I've heard, um, you know, I've heard he really likes James Franklin. James Franklin did an amazing job in the SEC when he was at Bandy. But James Franklin is also, is also a big candidate for USC. And again, this is the Saban factor a little bit. Um, James Franklin has a good job at Penn State. He has Ohio State in the same division. Ohio State is better positioned to be really good even than Penn State. That's the USC appeal. There's no Ohio State in your in the Pac-12 South, and there's absolutely no Alabama Nick Saban in the Pac-12 South. So I think James Franklin's situation is going to be interesting. And then after you get back to that, and I talked about this a little bit on our big noon show yesterday on Fox, uh, I understand that there are a couple of influential people at inside LSU who really are high on Mel Tucker. Mel Tucker's a former Saban assistant. He has knows the knows the league well from his time as a coordinator at Georgia and certainly on Nick Saban's staff at Alabama. But would he make a third move in like five years? Because he was only at Colorado for one. He's a year and a half in at Michigan State. He's doing a really good job there. But again, you know, I don't you know, it's it's an interesting situation. I mean, of who they end up with. I mean Billy Napier's done a really good job at Louisiana over in Lafayette. I just don't know if LSU folks are going to say, hey, we're going to, you know, we fired a guy who won a national title. And we're going to hire somebody who who's in the Sun Belt in our, you know, in our state. I don't know if that feels big enough to them. But for everything I heard, this will be Scott Woodward's hire. I'm sure he'll get a lot of feedback from a bunch of different people. But, you know, we'll see where he lands on this. Bruce, if you were making a hire in today's college football world, would you focus on offense or defensive minded guys as a head coach? It's a good question. I mean, my instinct would say to be on, you know, to go the offense route. I mean, I, I think it's got to be, you have to feel like whoever it is, because I mean, there's been guys who have succeeded with both kinds of background. Obviously, Satan's a defensive guy. Dabo was more on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, there's there's guys from, from all angles. I just think you, feel, you have to feel like somebody has a strong command and a leadership presence, and they're also going to work their butts off as recruiters you know i think we saw that urban meyer cared a ton about recruiting he won three national titles nick saban you know he had the, he basically created the blueprint that a lot of coaches at different places are trying to follow i mean that was critical to him ed ogeron won a national title at lsu because he recruited really well i mean i don't know if how many people thought of it this at the time but he recruited the heck out of joe burrow because he bought in, and Joe Burrow turned out to be arguably the greatest player in LSU history. Um, you know, he wasn't a five-star guy, but he was, you know, like that became because the coach really, really cares about recruiting. I mean, whether he's an offensive guy or a defensive guy, I think he's got to be a leader, and I think he's got to bust his butt as a recruiter. He cannot be somebody who doesn't, who, uh, you know, has other people do it for him. I mean, he's got to care, especially in that conference at the end. You reported, and it's been reported, Ogeron is receiving his full buyout, nearly $17 million. You've got to buy out the staff that is in place now, and then you've got to go out and hire a staff. Have you gotten an idea of, of, of the fiscal sense that LSU sits in right now, or if money feels, I mean, it feels like no issue on this, this, this hire right now. Do you get an idea of where they sit from a, a fiscal standpoint? I'm, I'm curious to see how it's going to be, because if you're trying to get Dabo or Jimbo Fisher or James Franklin, you're going to have to pay them a fortune to get them to leave where they're at, right? And by the way, the two guys, especially Jimbo and Dabo, are paid in, in you know you know an incredible amount of money right now at their places. So I'm interested to see how that kind of financial piece you know happens. I mean, but look, you know, we know the SEC seems to make money hand over fist. Um, you know, there's going to be new deals coming up that, that they're in on, especially as they go from the SEC on CBS TV deal to ESPN ABC. So, you know, I'm sure that's a big factor in this. But again, if you're firing coaches less than two years after they win national titles, I mean, 
the money is going to, you know, you, you're going to be paying a fortune to make something happen. I mean, other places just can't swing that. They can't even fathom it. Um, it is widely recognized the relationship that, that you share with Ogeron, and he was asked this directly in his press conference just about 15 minutes ago. What do you expect next for him? You know, I don't think he will jump back into coaching anytime soon after this year. I mean, I don't know where you go after, you know, there's, after you you had your dream job, you led them to a national title, you end up getting fired. Like, where do you go after that? Yeah. I mean, I don't see him wanting to be anybody's defensive line coach. I don't see him wanting to coach at some mid-level power five or even a, a group of five. I don't even know what the next job would be. He's already been in the NFL as an assistant for, you know, he grew up a big Saints fan. I don't think he wants to, you know, I think he was fine with that, but he realized he was more wired for college. I do think, you know, Jordy, you mentioned the, the flip the script book. I know this, uh, you know, his own personal story, like a lot of what we talked about, like that, that book was framed as, okay, they went from, you know, to win a national title. But a lot of that's really the whole thing. And I, I think some people, or if I hadn't heard all these conversations from that I've had with him, I think people maybe don't quite get it, is everything about his life in terms of how he approaches things starts with how he's approached his recovery. Yeah. Um, you know, he's whatever, 20 plus years sober. And I think all those lessons he learned, I think he knows that, okay, I have a big platform. I can impact a lot of people if I want to go, go speak and go reach people on that front. So I don't know, you know, beyond that, if he has a big personality, he obviously has a big presence and he's a national championship winning coach. Does that mean he goes off and does some kind of TV, you know, as an in-studio guy? I don't know. I mean, he's obviously a guy that kind of this in, in, inimitable, you know, voice or people are going to go, yeah, can you understand him in studio? I don't know. It's a lot different than, you know, be, sitting and wearing a shirt and tie than it is, you know, wearing a polo and, and being horse when you're, you know, trying to win a football game. So I don't know where that goes, but like I said, I don't necessarily see him going to coach for going to coach someplace else after this. I, I, I'd be a little surprised. I'm not saying it, I would, I would be totally shocked that he has at the day and the day is still a football coach. And that's what those guys always do, but he's not a guy who goes and golfs. Like he just, you know, there's like, It'll be interesting what his next step is. I know he can, you know, kind of, he has his three sons, but where he goes from here um, afterwards, my guess is it, it's probably more inclined to be maybe some kind of TV route. Yeah. You expect the next six weeks to go smooth? Probably smoother than the last. Yeah. <laughs> it felt like it yesterday, you know? right? It felt, it did, and it did feel like it was a relief, a, a, a small sense of relief. I know that he was upset and it was a dream job, but. You know, sitting up there at that podium, you could tell that his his shoulders, it, they looked a little lighter. Yeah, I think it's hard for him to get asked about, like, how am I supposed to answer, right. like, the hot seat question 18 different ways? Because, like, I had a conversation with him maybe a week ago where, and I know he likes, you know, a bunch of people on the LSU beat. Um, and I think there was something where somebody had asked him something. I, I didn't hear it. I only got, like, you know, he had kind of filled me in on what had happened or yeah. whatever. And I think he was like, yeah, that didn't come out right or whatever. And I think it's like, I think that part is, is kind of can be exhausting. Like how, you know, I'm getting asked this question. I know why they're asking me it. And it's just like, but I, I'm not going to be able to elaborate. I'm not going to give some long glowing answer that they probably want or anything like that. Cause it just, at that point, I don't think it does him. I think he really thinks about it as like, I don't think this was doing me any good to sit there and go be very reflective on it. So with those questions not there, um, you know, like it, to spin it in a, a slightly different direction, like so, uh, I know a couple of the reporters had asked him about like, how do you recruit for LSU when you know you're not going to be the head coach? I genuinely believe like he loves LSU so much and kind of like has this in awe of LSU football, the entity that I don't think it's hard for him to recruit at all going forward just because, you know, I think he thinks, you know, being in Tiger Stadium is such a awesome kind of feeling to him that I, I, I get it on that. There's like, you know, it's a, it's a, 
you know, when we worked on that book, he talked about some of these players he grew up idolizing in the 60s and 70s. And I think that part of him is still is still there. So the idea that he's still coaching there, I think in some ways, you know, like he he I think knew that it was, he was not going to he was probably getting let go. He knew he was getting let go. I think before he took the field yesterday yeah. and we saw that team play well, I I'm not saying they're going to run the table because they still have a really tough schedule, but I could see, you know, him being a lot, uh, you know, even more relaxed now because of it. Um, thank you as always for the excellent insight. I can't get you out of here without asking you at least one about the college football scene right now. We're about that at the halfway mark and Georgia handled Kentucky yesterday for a de facto sec Eastern division, uh, division title. Um, Alabama has struggled here. How do you see the, 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 the lay of the land here at the halfway point? I really think that, you know, Georgia's defense has been so dominant. Uh, but I have questions a little bit about, about their offense. You look, Jordy, the last five teams that have won the national titles have all had like elite quarterback play. Even the ones before that who had won, you know, Jacob Coco won a title with Alabama. They had elite skill guys if they didn't have it. Um, you know, at the quarterback position. And, and to me, that's the part where we're going to find out a lot about a lot more about, you know, where that shapes up. I mean, Oklahoma has been an interesting ride now that Caleb Williams has taken over, you know, Ohio state with their defense being, you know, being overhauled. Clemson has been a dud this year and they are kind of at least this year falling off the map. It's an interesting year. It really is an interesting season. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not ready. To, I'm not sold on Georgia as good as their defense has been. But I guess, you know, right now they have been the closest thing to dominant. You know, I think it's hard for people to buy in on Iowa. as You know, their defense was opportunistic. Their offense was kind of blah. Um, I'm fascinated to see who the four team, playoff teams are going to be. Because right now it's – I'm not I'm not getting off Alabama because it's, it's Saban and they still have some terrific players. Um, you know, that's kind of like the default answer. I mean, I, if you ask me now, who do I think will win the national title? I, will, I feel more confident in Bryce Young than I do in whoever's quarterback in Georgia. Bruce Feldman is on Twitter, at Bruce Feldman CFB. Pick up all the books. They're all a great we, uh, read. I would start with Meat Market. If you want to end with Flip the Script and everything in between, uh, it, is, it is great to uh, read his work. As we said, all of that on Twitter. You can read the latest over at The Athletic, which is laying out some of who could be next over at LSU that went up three hours ago. We appreciate you jumping on and sharing some insight with us as always. It's good to hear from you, my friend. Thank you, man. Oh, always a pleasure, Jordy. Take care. See you. There is uh, Bruce Feldman checking in from the West Coast tonight with uh, about 25 minutes of insight on what could uh, possibly shake out for LSU uh, over, the, uh, over the next couple of weeks there. Uh, he's got a great relationship with Ed Ogeron, uh, obviously has seen Scott, Wood, uh, Scott Woodward uh, handle coaching searches before, so for him to give uh, his insight and give his look at it was uh, was cool for him to do that here with us.